You're listening to The Dental Guys, episode 73, Zirconia Crowns, Bond or Cement? In this week's episode, we update our listeners on the newest information about bonding and cementing crowns, specifically zirconia. We got some inspiration from Marcus Blatt's recent article talking about the APC concept. What is it? We'll tell you all about it, plus we'll update you on how we are currently bonding and cementing our crowns, and our veneers today. We'll give you some great product information and really get you up to speed with what should we be doing today in our practices day-to-day to ensure safe and predictable bonding for crowns for years to come. It's coming up right now, another action-packed episode of The Dental Guys. This episode of The Dental Guys is brought to you by the Dental Crafters Network, your implant restorative connection. From surgical planning to patient-specific guides, quality implants, and final restorations, the Dental Crafters Network provides one relationship with infinite possibilities. Call 1-800-472-8302 today. That's 1-800-472-8302. And by Restorative Driven Implants. Understand, place, restore, and implement dental implant treatment from John and Wes. The Dental Guys. Go to restorativedrivenimplants.com right now to sign up for the next series of courses and take your implant education to the next level. And welcome to this week's episode of The Dental Guys. I'm Wes, The Dental Guy. And I'm John, The Dental Guy. And man, it's <laughs> been a it's been an interesting evening trying to get this uh, live streaming working, but man, yeah, you've got, here we are. You, you you had a little accident on the way over. You got stuck in fair traffic. Yeah, Green County Fair. So small town Tennessee, you know, the county fair is like the big deal, you know, and I think there's a country band playing tonight. So, you know, half the towns, I forgot about that. I was coming back home from my Spear Study Club meeting. Uh, that was not like a spear plug there. I really was at my Spear Study Club meeting. And, uh, and, uh, <laughs> Came in and I forgot that the fair was going on. So like I, I'm like, oh yeah, Wes, I'll be there in like five minutes. And then I get stuck in like 500 like dually diesel trucks, you know, that are all coming out of the fair. So yep. So here I am, made it. That's okay, um, man. I'm glad you're here. I'm here sipping on uh, tea, Earl Grey, hot. You know, good. as I don't know many of you who care about Star Trek, but I do. <laughs> and uh, this past weekend, or actually this past week and during Comic-Con, one of the greatest announcements of all time was that Jean-Luc Picard is back. Um, Patrick Stewart is doing some type of a Trek show um, with um, Jean-Luc Picard. So wow, I'm super That's excited big. about that. I don't know that there's a script written yet. I know that he Does it really matter if there's a script? I mean, all we need to know is that... Captain, Captain Picard Picard's is coming back, back, man. I don't know yeah. what kind of role it'll be, but it's going to be awesome. I'm super, I'm super Trekkie, so yep. anything sci-fi, sign me up. So, yeah. John, by the way, you need to go see uh, Missions in, Mission Impossible. Oh, I saw it. it. Oh, you did? It's I amazing, saw it, isn't it? And I really was impressed. No spoilers. Yeah. <laughs> there may be no, I was very really impressed. I was not expecting much from it because... It good. Uh, man, you know, sometimes you just get a franchise like that that gets played out, but it was actually really good. It's one of the best ones yet, I thought. I, so. I agree. I agree. It was good every, all the way around, and uh, they haven't ruined it. Yeah, They still made it something where you can just go have, like, some mindless fun for a couple of hours, but still with, like, a decently, you know, enough complexity to the script that it's not, like, you know, just a pure action movie. So, right. good, good stuff. Good, good stuff. stuff. And, so, some special stuff coming up for us. Yeah, yeah. Again, I just want to mention it uh, today. I mentioned it earlier. John, tell us a little bit about some things coming up in the month of September. Well, September's a big month. Uh, we are going to be out at the Spear Summit uh, in Arizona. And the Spear Summit's kind of a big deal. Uh, it's always a big deal. But this year, it's the 10-year anniversary of the summit. And uh, What does that mean? Well, that means that this year, uh, Spear is bringing out um, kind of the top speakers as far as reviews and requests from their last 10 years and letting them uh, come back and give kind of an encore presentation. So basically, it's just like they are they feel like it's their best of the best, uh, you know, coming back. And so there's a lot of great guest speakers there with some names that are just, you know, <laughs> very recognizable, uh, including people like Dennis Tarnow, Stephen Shu, Rebecca Bacow, Marcus Blatz, uh, Harold Heyman. I mean, these are people that, 
you know, if you pay attention to dental research or you're just a dental nerd in general, um, they, they make you pretty excited. And they asked us to come out and cover uh, the summit, do some interviews, do some uh, uh, kind of man on the street interviews with people there to see, you know, what kind of an effect it's having on their practice. You know, the thing that we, when we first, Wes and I both got involved with Spear, I mean, we pretty much chronicled this whole thing on the show. And, you know, we want to, one of the things that, you know, we kind of think is important for people uh, to know about organizations like Spear, because they're not the only good one out there, there's lots of good ones, uh, is that, you know, if you're just a, a, a general dentist um, or restorative dentist, that you can get a lot from these organizations that are um, that are typically, you know, people think of them as being like a full arch, you know, you learn how to do full arch stuff. Well, you know, you really can take what they teach you and you can incorporate it into any practice. And that's something that's cool about Summit is you're going to get stuff that's, you know, kind of pie in the sky, full arch, big stuff, but you're also going to get stuff that really changes the way you think about your everyday practice. So I'm, I mean, I'm pumped, Wes. I mean, he, we're going to get to like, we're going to have some all stars on the show. And it's get some, pretty amazing. I, oh. I, I'm, I am excited. Um, this is going to be September uh, 13th, 14th, yeah. and 15th. We'll have some live stream stuff going on. Yep. We'll also have some interviews that we'll get uh, uh, brought to you, kind of produced later, released as episodes. Uh, it's going to be kind of a combination of things. Uh, we'll have probably some of the spirit faculty on, some of the guest we'll speakers on. We'll know more about it as time goes on. And, yeah. you know, we're kind of getting information out of the spear. Um, ecosystem, you know, uh, we're communicating directly with them regarding this. This is super pumped. I'm, I'm excited. Thank you so much for Spear Education for allowing us to cover this and asking us to cover this uh, this uh, summit this year. Um, on to other things too. John, this fall, uh, restorative driven implants gets kicked back off. We, As you know that John and I um, are part of a uh, implant continuum and we've helped to kind of launch that this year. In 2018, we had kind of our alpha launch um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. in the spring, and it was a great success. We were able to uh, provide uh, many patients with dental implants that they needed, but um, we got to help train um, dentists um, to place dental implants in their practice and successfully implement them. I think it's ex- exciting uh, this uh, coming course is really close to being sold out. I think there's yeah. maybe one or two I think spots open. One, I think there's one spot. If you spot. mention our name, they just might let you in, yeah. but I know that I talked to um, um, our sponsors there today, and it is really close to being full. If you're interested in signing up, listen, I think it's a great value for uh, you know right at $10,000. You're going to get close to 60 CE hours. Uh, It's a mixture of online and live lecture. Uh, Series one involves um, an online portion uh, taught by me on the basics of dental implant engineering and medical history and all those kind of nuts and bolts things. And then you arrive and then you're learning uh, healed ridge placement. And then day two, you get to learn surgical principles from Dr. Jan Bublik. And uh, we're going to be doing some suturing exercises and things like that. And then Series 2, again, another online component that you'll complete prior to arriving on another weekend. And man, and then John, you know, you arrive and it's immediate extraction, immediate placement. We're going to do some pig jaws that that afternoon. And then Day 2 of Series 2, you get to teach the restorative component, which kind of ties it all together. Restorative driven implants is where it's at. And then the third weekend, it is two days of surgery at an amazing place uh, up in the northern woods of Wisconsin. We are super excited about that facility, and thank you so much for allowing us to help and be a part of that. And uh, and then day three, a half day of implementation with Dr. Todd Haley. So if you don't have a place or you are looking for a place to learn how to place dental implants, if you can get into this course, great. If you can't, I don't know. We can't, I don't think we can make the announcement yet, John, no. of where it's going to be next. No, we have to be careful. We have but to be we've careful. Got another but it course is coming already because it's, in the works yeah, John. for the spring. So it's it's coming, and uh, we're pretty excited about the location. But we just can't yeah. until we have everything like totally nailed down. Uh, we can't really uh, you know talk about that. But 
Uh, yeah. But we're definitely, you know, the, the, main, the main thing about this, you know, we know there's lots of good places that you can learn about dental implants, but we feel like we're going to provide um, a lot more real-world patient experience. You know, it's, it's a lot different when you come in and you're treating, uh, you know, people that uh, mm. are maybe doing maybe all full arch treatment or, and you're getting to put in one of six implants, for instance. You know, that's cool. Right. That's still very cool. But the kind of cases you're going to get to do uh, on live patients with uh, with RDI are going to be the kind of things you're going to see every day. These are going to be amazing. extraction, immediate placements, single one or two implants at a time. You get to also ex experience some of the bigger case stuff if you want to get into that. Uh, but mainly it's all restoratively driven. So everything you're going to learn is based upon restorative principles. That's what we're all about because that's where it all started with us. We didn't start out you know, with implants as our number one thing, we started off with the restorative side and the surgical side is driven by that. So if you're looking for more control over what's going into your patient's mouths with implants, and even if you just want more information about just the simple stuff and how to do better restorations, you're going to get all of that. So excited about that. And, you know, one of the things that's coming and I'll give just a little maybe preview into what we're going to be talking about uh, on tonight's show uh, mm. is, is, uh, you know, we talked about Spear Summit <clears throat> One of the people that's going to be out at the summit this time uh, is Marcus Blatz. And Marcus Blatz, we actually met him uh, a couple years ago at a digital dentistry uh, conference uh, down in Florida. Super nice guy, very, very smart guy. Um, and uh, we're, uh, he just, he's going to be talking about his concept of how to uh, bond zirconia, the APC concept, which stands for air particle abrasion, zirconia, zirconia primer, and adhesive composite resin. And he's going to be presenting on some of that uh, out at Summit. And so we really wanted to talk a little bit about the article. Uh, what does it mean for us? Does it change any of the things we're doing in our practice as far as how we uh, you know, cement or bond zirconia? And that's going to be a pretty interesting discussion, I think, Wes, because mm -hmm. everybody, you know, when last time we did an episode on, cem on cementation, uh, it was ago. huge, you know, so I, I think that's, uh, I'm looking forward to kind of updating that for people to, uh, to find out what's new in 2018. Have, have things changed? Are well, this, we, are we going to now do things different? Well, this all came about, John, can you boost your audio levels coming towards me just a little bit for the live stream? It'd be great. Thank you so much for that. Sure. You know, this all came about with, uh, me laying in bed Saturday morning, and I'm flipping through my Facebook. You know how you do. You get your phone upside down, it lands on your face, and you're like, whoa. Yeah, it hurts. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I was scrolling through my Facebook feed, and a uh, compendium of continuing dental education uh, popped up, and they did a throwback Thursday article last week from um, Marcus um, uh, Blotz. Now, I will say... This article, um, there were some disclosures in it, mm -hmm. and the disclosure is that Marcus, Dr. Blotz had received an honoraria from Nobel BioCare and uh, Cure, mm -hmm. uh, Nortaki, yeah. and then also uh, research support from 3M, and then also Miss um, uh, Sawyer here, who is part of the the team of a dental technician that received. Uh, paid consultant for from for uh, Cure Nortaki. So that means these people were paid to do this um, this report. Um, but it really was not so much John the the paper that really. I mean, I saw this and then I see people share it and they right. look at it like this is like the the gospel, right? Like that, this is something that's a game changer, right? We we. We've talked about some of these things before, but I do want to kind of use the article as a framework because it actually is pretty good. Yeah, um, yeah, it's a good article. Yeah, one of the things that it talks about is, you know, a little history on zirconium. You know, yttrium stabilized zirconium has been around for a long time, John. I started doing zirconium crowns in 2003 and was using a milling center out of the Northeast uh, one of the first milling centers in in North America, I think actually Brad, the dental lab guy, had, if not the first 3M lava mill um, with these other people. They were shortly right behind him. And we I happened to be using this other company at the time. And really, 
um, I moved right into private practice starting to use full contours or cutting. Now, I was still using PFMs at the time, but anyway, Mm -hmm. I digress a little bit there that to say that zirconium has been around a long time, since the 1990s. It's not new, but there is um, some things and properties about zirconium that it's important to understand. Now, let's kind of contrast zirconium first with what's uh, been around for forever. John, tell us a little bit about silicate-based ceramics. Classify those for us and tell us a little bit about silicate-based ceramics, and then maybe I'll come back and hit on the non-silica-based ceramics. Yeah, I think that uh, one of the things that we want to talk about in this discussion is, you know, how, what are the differences of, of how this all, this is all going to come back to bonding and cementation, right? Because in the end, really what we want to talk about is, um, how are the what's the difference between these materials as far as how we actually put them in patients' mouths? But the two major categories, as Wes said, are the silica based and the non silica based. And so the silica based ones would be your typical feldspathic porcelain, what used to be the porcelain that we put on our PFMs, which now we put on our cutbacks when we cut back zirconia, when we cut back Emacs. Um, but then the newer silica base, which would be your lucite reinforced and lithium disilicate material. So this is Empress and then Emacs. Um, these are materials because they're silicate based um, that you actually can bond to them. Uh, when you talk about uh, silica based, there we know we've been using them for a long time, and we know exactly what we can do to get a very very durable, long lasting bond. And uh, so this is what we've been using for years back even in the days of PFM. And so if you had a PFM chip, you could easily bond things back to it. You could add to the ceramic. You could even put composite and add to the ceramic if you treated it properly. The biggest question has come since we've had these non-silica-based high-strength ceramics. And Wes, you can talk about those and kind of yes. what, what are those. Well, that's simply that's um, basically this you know product called zirconium we talked about, but also alumina. Mm-hmm. And really, the the should be Dura, like Procera, right? Yeah. Procera, right? I remember the first Procera crowns that I ever saw in residency, and they just—it was like, man, right? It's amazing. I remember I mean, they like, came in a little red box with yeah. like a a little like velvet insert. It know, was like amazing. It was, it was like jewelry. this is the next level. <laughs> I right. mean, it was oh, unbelievable. Yeah. Before there was a next level, this was it. I mean, you were seeing something that didn't have a metal core. I mean, I remember like we were all peering around this full arch case that our resident director was using, and um, I've I've listened to Frank Spear talk about Procera and and how many cases that he did with that, um, even before uh, Emacs. But this non-silica based ceramic uh, came across as a very strong um, substitute um, for. Um, the silicate based ceramics right now, because the idea was you didn't you you you, you could cement it you could cement right. this material because it was so strong that you did not have to well, bond it in order to get strength as dentists we like to keep things the same consistent so if i'm going from a gold crown coming in one day or in the same day if i'm cementing a gold crown this very same day if i have the assistant sets on a procera crown or a zirconium crown hey, I can use the exact same cement and nothing changes in my practice except one thing. The patient gets a more aesthetic restoration maybe per se if, if, you know, the technician or the, the, the diagnosis was done right for the tooth. But there's some very different things between what we can do to silicate based ceramics and non-silicate based ceramics. John, you talked about bonding to silicate based ceramics, but Mm -hmm. there's some protocols before it gets to your office. Most of the time, um, people like Brad, the dental lab guy, prepare the ceramic in certain ways, and there's some certain do's and don'ts regarding what to do and what not to do. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, let's talk about that. You know, before we get into this paper by Blotz, which I think is going to kind of get us to where we are today, with uh, especially with zirconia bonding, let's talk about what we know. You know, what yep. we know is that if you want to bond to the silica-based ceramics, that you have to treat them in a very uh, specific way, and we know exactly how that has to happen. 
pretty much what we're relying on to bond to these is that if we treat these with hydrofluoric acid etching, mm -hmm. that we can uh, basically dissolve part of that glassy matrix that's uh, part of these ceramics, leaving behind just a really rough surface, essentially, and that uh, we can attach to that. And so uh, that has been something we've been doing for years. So we, we first hydrofluoric acid etch, then we have to apply a silane coupler. And a silane coupler is going to go essentially into those areas and increases its adhesion by basically interlocking with the silica oxides into the cement. So you get this interlocking of your resin with your etched glassy matrix, and it forms a very durable, uh, very, very strong bond. So when you get your Emax crown, your Empress crown, your veneer that's feldspathic porcelain, um, your, your porcelain repair on your PFM, you go through these same processes, and as long as you're doing it in a, in a good, predictable way, you're going to get success. Now, there's, uh, there's even some newer things out there uh, which uh, purport to allow you to uh, attach to um, ceramic like that without etching, without hydrofluoric acid etching, or kind of being more of a one-step process. That's where there's some new research going on. There are some companies that have released products like that, I think, to make things faster. But I think at this point, what we know is that that's still the best way. The other option, you can use what's called tribochemical silica coating or bonding. And that's a treatment that you put into basically a sandblaster, but it's not your typical aluminum oxide. It's a specific type of particle. Um, and when you uh, hit the uh, Emacs or the feldspathic, the silica type of ceramic with these particles, they actually get embedded into that glassy matrix. Yeah, this isn't so aluminum oxide we're talking about. Here. Right, not aluminum oxide, not what most of us are using. You got to be very uh, careful about that because yeah, you this is a material cracks. called Cojet uh, that you can buy from uh, from a company, major company. And you, when you embed these particles into the ceramic, um, now it essentially we got to really geek out. It increases the free energy of the whole of the of the surface, and you can now uh, bond your resin uh, directly to that. So we know that these things work. They've been used. They've been studied. They've been proven. That's why veneers work. That's why feldspathic right. veneers work because of this process alone. If it was not for that process, they would all immediately. Uh, come right off and fracture. So really the difference here is that one is that, you know, these silicate base, we can do some things chemically and embed some particles in them to enhance um, the ability or actually create a, a <clears throat> layer that is bondable. Mm -hmm. and, and really with high strength metal oxides, like zirconium and aluminum, that those become cementable because of their inherent strength. So, right. for instance, a monolithic block of zirconium, you know, a lot of them have megapascal strength, you know, between 800 and 1200 megapascals. Now, 1200, uh, some of the, the, the Pratau bridges from uh, Zircon Zon, you know, their crowns, I mean, it's a very expensive zirconium and has very good translucency, been around for years, 1,200 megapascals. That, that's approaching the, you know, the, the flexural strength of, of some of our metals and, uh, well, base metals like gold, uh, things like that. So those high strengths allow us to cement them. Now, the interesting thing is, is that it used to be thought that we could embed something into the alumina and into the zirconium, just like what John was talking about with the silicate. So we tried to apply what we knew about silicate-based, like mm -hmm. Emacs, those products, feldspathic porcelains, and tried to apply it to zirconium. It didn't work. In well, fact, I, I want to even maybe go back one step on that because you're absolutely right and we're gonna because we're gonna talk about that in more depth too but why you know this article i want to go yeah. back just for a minute to like why are we talking about this because the yeah. biggest thing here is is like all well, right so we know we can use emacs we know we can bond emacs we know we can bond feldspathic we know so if zirconia is so strong which we know it is 
then why are we having the discussion about even bonding it? What's the point? And well, here, here's and the I thing, think John. that I think that Blotz's whole Pe- thing yeah. is he's talking about the fact that now or there are these higher translucency zirconias right. that people are are wanting to use because they have more translucency and they look better. Now with, that's a whole other discussion about whether or not. Um, you should even be using those versus, say, Emacs, and we can talk about that if we have time. Mm-hmm. But uh, once you start to say, okay, now my cubic zirconia type of materials are in the 550 to maybe 750 megapascal range, well, now you do need maybe something that you can bond, maybe something you can increase the strength, just like Emacs has some increased strength when you bond it. And I think, too, you have people that are wanting to use zirconia for everything. They're wanting to use it for veneers. That's They're wanting exactly to right. u- use it for onlays and inlays. Um, so <sighs> I think that's led to people trying to bond it because, you know, we want to bond everything. That's cool. You know, well, everything here. So we don't just want to bond everything. We want everything to be stronger. Right. right? We want everything. To I be mean, stronger. the case that, that they show in this is that they show that Hey, here's a wear case. Here's somebody that has wear. Mm-hmm. Okay, we're going to open vertical. We're mm-hmm. going to do minimally invasive preps. Right. Okay, we're going to preserve enamel. So let's give him the strongest restoration. Now, I, if your preps are terrible, we could, you know, I'm sorry, if your preps are terrible, nothing's going to work. Okay, right. but if we're going to take the strongest, Everything that we know, and we're going to say, well, this guy's got a wear problem. Let's give him the strongest restoration possible. And everything is driven in dentistry to providing something, it seems like, stronger. Right. And therefore, we want something that doesn't come off. It's a bad day. Okay, honestly, John, the whole thing here revolves around whenever you see show up on your schedule an emergency, okay, for a crown that come off and you're sitting in your office or you're sitting in the clinic praying that it wasn't one of your crowns. Right. Right. Because if it's not one of your crowns, well then great. But if it's somebody else's crowns, then you get to redo it or recharge for re-cementation. If it's one of your crowns, you're thinking, oh, the cement wasn't strong enough or, oh, I should have had more, you know, axial walls you know that should have been more parallel or oh crap you know now it's broken off of the gun line and i did it two years ago now what do i do the conversation with the patient gets a little bit more interesting and so automatically a dentist said just put it on with the strongest thing ever i don't want it ever coming off and if it's if resin cement helps it all then bond it on bond 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 and i just don't i think that this article really shed some false hopes um right should we even be doing this yeah i think that when can we do it well when well the first question is is can we well maybe the first question is should we you know i mean i guess the the first thing when i see this kind of stuff of course i always start to ask watching this and listening to this right now we are going to get to the brass tack yeah, man. I mean, we're this gonna, is because because guys, this is day to day dentistry. Like this right. is day to day dentistry. I mean, everything I, we're talking about. I don't want my crowns coming off. Right, right. But I'm, so, I'll tell a story here. And after when we get to protocol, I'm going to tell you a story about West Mullins, okay? And crowns coming off, and John will too. But go ahead, John. Go ahead. I'm I'm digressing well, I, a little bit. I, I just I just think that you know this. L- let's just let's just back up to the last time. That we, because I think this will this will really address this this issue head on. That you know, we we talked about this. We talked about bonding to zirconia once before, about a year ago, and um, you know, and and the funny thing to me is when this article came out. Okay, this article we're referring to from Blast 2016, came out, right? October 2016. Well, I think he must not have known that at the same time this <laughs> article got into publication, there was another article that was being put into publication that we referenced in ours, which is uh, a systematic review in JPD, Journal of Prosthetic Dentistry, called, that's entitled, Is There a Potential for Durable Adhesion to Zirconia Restorations? A Systematic Review. And I think this is where we're going to get down to brass tacks, okay? Because what we're going to, what Blotz is showing is that his technique that he goes through here, which we're going to talk about in just a minute, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it does result 
in some bond strength to zirconia, okay? We are not going to argue that there are some new products and materials that can create a bond, but here's the thing. The question is, does it last? Does it last, okay? Because we know the Emacs or the, any of the feldspathics or any of the silica-based ceramics, the bond lasts. So there's kind of two, dis two discussions I, I think we should have here, Wes, if you agree. I think the first discussion is let's talk about Let's talk about his protocol. Let's talk about does it work short term, and then let's talk about does it work long term. And then the second discussion we sh I think we should have is, you know, why are why are we having this discussion about bonding zirconia in the first place? Should should we even be talking about that? You know, is and and then what should we be doing today with zirconia? I mean, is right. that is that sound reasonable? Like, let's talk about his protocol. Why don't we just well, talk about it? Yeah, the, his protocol is pretty simple. Okay, it's not rocket science. Okay, he calls it the APC zirconium bonding concept. Now it sounds pretty awesome. I it like sounds it. Sounds awesome, man. I'm I'm like already wanting to okay, buy APC. whatever he's I mean, selling. It's like, is this CPR? You know, I mean, like this is it right, right. here. This, this was created C by 3M scientists. I'm it's just sure. CPR for your crown. Mm -hmm. Okay, so <laughs> y'all down with okay. APC? Yeah, you know me. So yeah, I'm down with it. Down okay, with, so down with APC. let's start with the sample. You take your you take your temporary off. All right, you clean your prep. We've already talked about this. Clean your preps, okay? And the success of this bonding technique really relies, he says, on proper material selection. So you can't cheap out, okay? And adequate treatment of the tooth and restoration uh, bonding surfaces. Okay, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so basically what you do is you treat the tooth, okay, with a bonding agent as recommended by the manufacturer. So only dentin-specific bonding, okay, specifically indicated for indirect restoration should be selected as self-etch adhesives are limited to direct restorations due to their increase in film thickness and photopolymerization. Now what that means is... Basically, don't use a self-etching primer, right, John? Right? Yeah, I think that that's. I think he's. I think that's what he's talking about. That um, that he's he's specifically wanting. I don't think he's saying there at all. Actually, I, I think that he, I don't think he's saying self etch not use self-etching primer. He's saying only use dentin bonding agents or self-etching primers that are specifically indicated for indirect restoration. Indirect, so, right? Yeah. Okay, so for somebody who's saying, you know, this is. You know, Cura A's uh, specific material made for their resin for their bonding agent, or for right. okay. 3M yeah, 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 or whatever that. product you're using. Yeah. Okay. I think so that's the, the resin thing. the resin bond to high strength ceramics has been investigated for more than two decades now. Okay, so it has, but the articles that they reference here, okay. They Just all a, show a yeah. short-term bond. They but, all. Well, show but hold on a second. Hold on a yeah. second, Wes. Let, let's start. Where you're getting into the next thing, which is about. <laughs> The whether it works. Let's just what? go through what the protocol okay, is. Okay, okay. Step, step a. one. Step, step one. A clean is... zirconium with air particle abrasion. That's the yeah. A. Okay. Yeah, you... What air air particle abrasion? Yeah. All right. So you you try it in, and it fits great. You're getting ready to cement it. You take it out. You take it back to your lab. Okay. And you use aluminum oxide. Okay. Yeah. Now. We can go into how much yeah. pounds per square inch. Yeah, and all but just you can read the day. paper, but it just right. says decontaminates. Decontaminates. And, and you want to use IvaClean, use IvaClean, right. clean it right. out. Okay, exactly. steam clean it, whatever you want to do. Clean it, all right? Second thing, all right, John? Yeah, so the second P. thing is ceramic primers. That's the P. So it remembers APC, so, so the A, A is air particle abrasion. Right. Uh, step P is... The ceramic primer, which is going to have a specific, and you know, he goes into specifics about that the primer must have the monomer MDP, which has been something that's been so uh, like was Z released. Prime Plus, right? Right. Well, Z Prime Plus, or it's uh, Monobond, Monobond Plus from Ivaclar, which is right. what I use. It's you know, uh, you've got Curare, has got ceramic primer. I mean, there's a ton of them that all mm -hmm. have basically the same stuff. Some of them have silanes along with them, but the You're main looking thing for the MDP is you know, MDP. The three, that's three right. letter acronym. Right, and so you're 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 getting a product that's made for zirconia, okay? So and you're, you're going to scrub apply that in, there, that. right? Right, you're going to apply that to, um, yeah, and and uh, 
And, and he says specifically, remember that silanes have no contributing effect to these bond strengths. It's the primer with MDP. And then yeah. step C, which is what hey, was. Hey, basically door self-cure composites. Okay? Yeah. So cements. So, resin so cements. cements. Yeah. So you're going to use like a Relax Ultimate, um, something like that, a even a Unisim per se, but I'd probably stick with like a dual cure like Relax Ultimate. That's the green 3M stuff. Okay? Mm -hmm. Put it in, light cure it. Tack it, clean it, you're done. Right. And so right. that is, and so, you know, his, his uh, conclusion after that is, it says, the described APC zirconia bonding concept is not new, he says, but rather a culmination of research studies spanning two decades to identify effective yet clinically feasible bonding protocols. Findings from recent systematic literature reviews which evaluated the data of more than 140 studies arrive at the same conclusion. So he's saying... Hey, this isn't new. So he he says that it's not new, but he says basically this is the best that we that we have. So, so A, uh, air particle abrasion, mm -hmm. B, zirconium or P as in Paul, zirconium primer, right. C, adhesive composite resin, the APC concept. Right. So this is the best that we have right now, and that's his point is that this is the best we have right now. The thing though that we have to ask next okay so that's the concept that's the concept now this is is it what, true this is where i have a problem with this paper because in the abstract it says the apc zirconia bonding concept is based on decades of research on how to achieve yeah. high and long-term durable bond strength to high strength ceramics yeah because i just want to flip on over and my little pdf tabs here to <laughs> the to the, the study that was published literally a couple months later in... Please share. Uh, please share. In, why do they disagree, John? Well, and why is this better? Why is this a better thing? Right. So, so you know, this, this systematic review, just to give you a little idea here, uh, the current literature of studies was uh, clinical studies from 1998, 1998 to 2014. 134 publications were identified for analysis. Different adhesive techniques with different testing methods were reviewed. Okay, and they looked at everything. They looked at airborne particle abrasion, tribochemical silica coating, adhesive monomers, uh, surface contamination factors, uh, what the aging conditions, all these things. Okay, so what's the conclusion? I'm not. We, we've already. If you want to hear more about this, we already covered it like a, a year ago, so it's not new. What's the clinical implications in the JPD study? No universally accepted protocol exists for long-lasting and biologically safe zirconia cementing. So I want to just make sure that that if, if you... Uh, this is an article that you really need to be familiar with, in my opinion, because it's not... Almost all of these studies... I mean, they looked at everything, man. They looked at studies where people treated zirconia with lasers, man, like freaking lasers, okay? And they... They, they were trying to see if there was anything that would increase the bond strength. And they found on almost everything they did, most everything they did, that they got an, an, a very good or pretty good initial bond strength, sometimes even a higher bond strength than what they were getting to the silica-based. But the problem was, is that, and they did find, okay, I will say, that the highest long-term bond strength did contain, did contain MDP or MDP primers. So that is definitely true that the longest term. But when you talk about the long term... Yeah, how many months was it? Yeah, the long term was like when they put it in any kind of artificial aging, in any yep. kind of temperature, along with moisture. You start moisture, putting this stuff in the oral environment, what happens? It, it falls apart. Yeah, It falls apart every single time. Okay, and so can you bond zirconium? Not predictably long term. Not predictably long term. But that's term. not the question that, that that people are asking. Like, and this is my this is the big issue that we have with a lot of the stuff that's out there about bonding. And this is why, like, we keep rattling on about how people don't know anything anymore about their own materials and their own practices. They Thank they you. hear this study from Blotts and they go, they think that when Blotts says the APC zirconia bonding concept. You know what they read on that? They go, hey, it's because it says what? It says how to bond zirconia, mm -hmm. all right? But what they don't realize is how to bond zirconia for like a week, 
you know, or how to bond zirconia for maybe a month or maybe but even John, a couple aren't of we months. headline readers? I mean, that's what we've become is we've become the dentist that just basically looks at dentistry today or we look at like, hey, if if Marcus Blot says it or if the headline says it and this person's name underneath it, we don't really dive in. And honestly, to do what we just did here uh, and what John and I've talked about for the last you know year or so about bonding zirconium crowns, really even before that, is so uh, you know the thing that that um, that you get from the JPD article. Now they'll say that there are a few studies that showed that um, th- that the aging process didn't affect the bond strength as much, but you know you find most of the most of the studies that they that they cite were that. Many, they, you know, here's here's the this again, just the words right out of this JPD study. In, uh, in polished zirconia surfaces, many spontaneous detachments occurred after an aging process, despite the influence of activators. Um, you know that that thermocycling causes repeated thermal con, uh, expansion and contraction, which causes fatigue and a reduction of bond values. And you know, there's another study that we cited that showed the same thing. So we're not saying we're not well, saying that you that like these things don't help at all. We're saying that they may help. But the question here is, is that, you know, are we, are we overselling this when we, we say, Hey, here's how to bond zirconia. We are totally overselling it. And listen, in my clinical experience, I've been doing it. I've been putting on crowns for 15 years now. Okay. In my private practice, so I have patients and been able to even cut off some of my own zirconium crowns that I placed back in 2003, 2004. And at, and here, here's my cementation story. So, uh, Mr. Nash over in, Dr. Nash over in North Carolina posted a cementation protocol for his crowns that, and I don't know if you know him, John, I think you've heard yeah. of him. Oh, yeah, Excellent guy, him. great guy. He yeah. posted back in a long time ago, back in 04 or something like that, his cementation protocol. At the time, we didn't know as much as we know today. There wasn't much research available today. And so, I switched everything in my practice over to Unisim minus um, anything that was highly aesthetic, then I would be use a Relax Veneer Cement, which is a light cure only cement. Mm-hmm. So, so I've had the opportunity to cut off some of my crowns. Yes, that happens. You have to cut off some of your crowns. I will, and I've cut off some of my PFMs too and other people's PFMs that have been bonded on. Mm-hmm. And let me tell you right now, I will much rather cut off a zirconium crown because guess where the cement is every single time. If I come up and I take my diamond burr and I go up the buckle and across the clusal and I take a separating instrument, guess what? It just blows right off and guess what's left on the prep? The relaxed yeah, uni- unisim, okay? Right, the unisim right. is there. It's there every time. It's not on the crown. It doesn't end up in the crown. Yep. But when I'm taking PFMs off, Okay, it's harder. It's harder right. to get the PFM off. Many times I'll take a PFM and I'll break off the mesial and then I'll have to come back and section the distal and bust it off. Mm-hmm. And because metal, like low noble metal and high noble metals will bond. Right. It will bond. And so what happened was is I've kind of come full circle on this and about three years ago, four years ago, I switched everything in my practice because I was relying too much on cement and I knew my preps were somewhat proper, okay? So I felt somewhat comfortable, Mm -hmm. but I didn't know for sure because I want everything to be strong over to resid modified glass onomer. And we'll talk Mm -hmm. about our protocols coming up. We don't have much time left, so I want to get right to this actually, is what we really want you to do, okay? And we may have the opportunity to speak to uh, Dr. Blatz at Spear Summit, and we are going to ask him what his thoughts are on this two-year-old article and how right. and and what's because going I, on I do want to just add, okay? Because it sounds like we're like bagging on this guy. He's not well, he, he's, wrong at listen, all about this is, being the best way we know how no. to do it now. He's not wrong at all. He's absolutely right that this is the best we know now. The, the problem, and, and there are times, Wes, where we really do need to, to get a, as good of a bond as zirconia. I think about on these zirconia full arch restorations we're doing, where we this have is where the metal cylinders right. yeah. bonded or looted or however you want to say it, 
uh, attached to the zirconia, this is where it is a big deal because well, and, you do yeah. need to have the best possible bond because things can be a problem. So, I mean, I'm all about, or think about our screw retained one piece crowns where we're bonding or cementing or looting, whatever you want to call it, zirconia crowns to titanium abutments or cylinders. So it is important that we're using the best possible technique. We just don't want you to start putting zirconia veneers on people because you think, oh, this bond is super proven and strong, and it's going to be something like what we get from our silica base. So Wes, let's talk about, you know, what do we do in our own practices today with zirconia? I, I'll start with what I do, and you. I want you to, I think we're doing the same thing. It's the same thing I've been doing now, as you, you said the same thing, for two, three years. It's I'm using resin-modified glass ionomer, uh, cement, uh, still using the same one. I'm using Kerr's Nexus RMGI because it's a light cured or light tackable material. So it, it, that's really nice because it, it's very quick cleanup. You can get in and out of there quickly. Plus, Let me ask you a question about that. Yeah. In your light cure, you're using the, um, the ultra dense, um, light, right? Yeah. The Velo. Yeah. 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 The Velo. And it has the burst mode. Yes. And so whenever you're tack curing, are you using the burst mode? I'm not. I, I just go five. I just have it on the regular cure what, mode. How many I'm seconds are you doing your tack? Five and five. So I'm doing five lingual, five buckle, which Before, is enough to basically gel the cement so that my assistant can immediately start removing it without having to wait. So okay, I basically I, apply it. They, they apply the cement to the crown. I put it in. I hold it uh, in place while they do a, like the tack cure, and then they immediately start removing cement. And then they will do a final cure uh, for 20 seconds. Um, with, just on uh, the occlusal the surface? Uh, they'll do from all surfaces. They go buckle, occlusal. Just kind of rotate label. around. Yeah, rotate seconds. around. That's that's what I'm typically doing. Right. Are you are you using the same cement? Is that right? The same. Yeah, RMGI. I'm using the same cement, but I'm also you. But I'm using a 3M uh, curing lamp. Mm -hmm. And um, I have I had mine tested by the way by the ultra dent lady because she's trying to sell me lights. And, oh yeah, and my, of course. My my three M lights will not die and. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but you know she has the burst mode. We can talk about burst mode. Yeah, burst mode's cool. Burst mode's cool, but I'm not. I don't have burst mode on my. I life. use it for kids. I use burst mode for kids. Right. I don't have. I mean, you know, I don't treat kids. I don't treat kids anymore. No. <laughs> <laughs> you, gave up, you gave up on kids last. I month, gave up right? on kids yeah. last week. So. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, yeah. I, I I thought I was doing. I thought my light was actually not working. I've been mean to ask you this, but oh. it. Because normally, like for Unisim, when I switched over, it was a one-second tack. Like, hold yeah. the button down one second. If you went more than that, you're done cleaning up Unisim. You're actually gr getting out the hand piece and grinding it off. With yeah. this, the cleanup's so much easier. Five seconds buckle, five seconds lingual, floss, floss, clean, clean. Assistant gets in there, cures the rest of the way, wipes it with a two-by-two, two, which is amazing. A wet two-by-two two cleans this stuff up unreal. Yeah, yeah. I'm using, go ahead, I'm using it for all zirconium crowns. What else are you using it for, uh, glass onomer? I, I mean, I, I am, so my only time, let me just put it this way. The only time I'm ever bonding a crown, okay, okay. ever bonding it, any, really. any crown, is when I have uh, a crown where I have low retention, uh, issue on the tooth. So I know that I have a compromised situation, like a very short prep. Right. And for whatever reason, I don't feel that I can get a better situation. The and you let the won't... patient know this? Yeah. These are cases that are compromised. You know, these are cases right. where, you know, a crown has come off, you know, and I'm telling the patient, look, we need to redo this crown. And but, they're like, no, don't no. want to do that. Or maybe it's a tooth where the patient needs crown lengthening. And I present that to them, but it would mean endo, crown lengthening, post. And they're we like, no. We all do this. We try to play hero a little bit. And you just inform right. the patient. You just tell the patient, look, I'm going to use the strongest stuff I got. Um, and this is all I got. And, you know, I, I, but the thing that changed in both of our practices uh, also a couple years ago is that I no longer use uh, bonding routinely with Emacs either. I, I loot every single Emacs and I have looted literally every single Emacs it's that I so have done. Awesome. It for made the last me at least three years, maybe four. And I mean, the only time I ever bond them, the only time I ever bond crowns is only when it's a low retention situation, which is like maybe like what, twice, three times a year. I mean, I don't do, I try to avoid using when I, when I have because to pull out. Because it's a pain, it's a pain to Yeah, bond when I have to correctly. pull out the resin cement for a crown, it's a bad day. Like that's something yeah. where I'm like, I've failed in some way, you know, well, Let or me just tell you, something, RMGI you know? is where it's at. Yeah. 
in it our works. practices. It works amazing. I haven't had crowns come off like I thought I would. I mean, right. like I believe the science. I drank the Kool Aid of yep. the of the research. Even the even only, when the Emax is a little, even when it's a little thinner, like I'm not afraid. And I don't feel like the opacity, it. even in the five, four five region and the twelve yep. thirteen region, where you might think there might be aesthetic compromise. The opacity yep. from the RMGI has not been an issue like I thought it would be. Right. And because at first that area scared me, even in the anterior for all ceramic crowns with yep. uh, lithium disilicate, I'm not afraid to use RMGI. In fact, I favor it now because yep. I know if I have to cut that crown off, my goodness, is it so much easier. Because if let me just tell you, you try grinding Emax off, you right. pretty much would just might as well just prep a tooth yep. like you were prepping it, you know, virgin tooth. That's been bonded with. Yeah. Um, with Agreed. I mean, I, I'm I'm thinking about the future of all you guys out there and girls who are bonding Emacs on. I'm thinking about all the Seric crowns that oh, are being bonded man. right now. Oh man! Now, <laughs> because that's make what a they comment. teach. A lot, there's a lot of Seric crowns that are being bonded on there because they're leaving a 200 <laughs> micron cement, cement ex- space. You know, I'm sorry, guys. Now I, gotta get I know this thing that's going to bring in all the. I've been in the chair gonna, for three hours. It's going to bring all the Seric <laughs> haters out now, or the Seric lovers out, bring thinking it. we're just hating on Seric. But you know, I'm sorry, guys. You know, I'm sorry. Whatever. I don't even gonna, I don't want to go any further into that. But I, there's a lot of crowns being bonded on with Emacs or with uh, resin but, cements, Emacs. Good luck cutting those things off, man. I hope so, they stay in your town and don't come to mine. So, John, when we're bonding, really bonding with our veneers, we're using mm-hmm. a light cure only most of the time. However, however, there's some recent studies that were released, not so recent, but let's just say in the last year or two, that John and I both have read about this color shift with some of these high-quality dual-cure resins. Yep. Appears to not be an issue anymore. It doesn't appear to with, be an with issue. Certain ones, with, with certain, certain ones. With certain ones. With that certain are not, ones. It used to be the amine-based right. uh, photo initiators would discolor over time. Right, and we've so seen like some... So like Canavia, for instance, was like horrible for that. Yeah. It would turn like brown. And of course, you didn't know that when Until it was under three a years crown. Out. But under a veneer, yeah, a couple of years in, you're like, why is my why are my veneers yellow now? So you really, know? what you can do is, um, you if you have a situation where you've got, you know, say a lot of times when you're doing veneer work, you know, you're you've got say five through twelve, mm-hmm. and five and twelve are all ceramic crowns, okay, right, or three right. quarter crowns. And you're like, man, I could actually use RMGI here, but if I do, it might throw my color off transitioning to my canine. So yep. you're like, well, I'll just bond it too. But the problem with that is with a light cure only cement is you might not be able to get down through the thickness of that lithium disilicate. So you better yep. use a dual cure. So then it's like now I've got two cements for two crowns. Yep. And then I got another cement for the anterior. So a lot of people have started moving to these dual cures for that very reason. Yeah. And, and the what test I'm has doing, been done. And what, and what I'm doing now for me, because I still, uh, so f- and maybe there'll be some technique I'll, I'll learn one day. About you do them all this, at once? I still, well, yeah, I, I always do with my veneers. And I still have to You're have light cure. I have to, <laughs> I still have to have light cure because I, I want that complete control <laughs> Uh, it stresses me yeah, out to no end too. I to try to dual thing, cure veneers. I just can't get there nope. myself. No way. So I have to have light cure. What I'm what I'm using right now that I love, and I just have to really plug this product because for me go. it's like Not the product sponsor. of the week for me. <laughs> yeah, I know they don't even sponsor us. Jeez, but uh, Ivaclar, man, they used to have very link veneer, great cement, but dude, it had like yeah. seven hundred different shades and you know <laughs> all this extra stuff you didn't it's like need. Thousand dollars just in cement. Oh, oh use. yeah, exactly. It was like a thousand bucks, and you'd sit, you know, it'd sit on your shelf, and you just cry. But now they have, uh, they came out well several several years ago now with Very Link's aesthetic uh, light cure system kit, which is for veneers. So now they've simplified it into three shades. They have neutral, warm, and light. So like this it. is. That's it. Neutral, warm, and light. And that's all I ever used anyway. I mean, I use neutral for 99% of what I do. The one time out of 100 I need a color change, it's either I want it a little warmer and more yellow, or I want it a little bit more white. So it's all I need. It comes with Monobond in the thing. It comes with their uh, cell fetch uh, uh, dual cure, uh, cell fetch uh, bonding material in there. It comes with etch. It comes with everything. And then they also have Vario Link Aesthetic dual cure. 
which is the exact same three shades, the exact same everything, except it's dual cure. So you can literally take your same, you can do your try-in with all the same try-in paste. You can do your uh, verification and then you can put your veneers on with light cure and you can put your crowns on with dual cure. Same shades, same choices, super simplified. Uh, and, and I just, I love it. I, all I ever needed was this cement. Like I just don't need all the other stuff because if you're having to use, you know, tints and stuff like that to change your veneers, you probably need to change labs because you're probably, or you need to change your prep or something. So I love this product. I use it all the time. And I love the fact that you can switch back and forth between dual cure and light cure with the same company with the same base shades. And I've, I've, I haven't seen any color change with the dual cure when I have used it um, under, under crowns that I've done. I don't use the dual cure version a lot. You know, that's, I only use it when I'm doing a combination veneer and crown case when I specifically need it. Typically I'm using Nexus, uh, our Nexus RMGI, but also ne uh, the NX3 cement from Kerr because that's the bonding system that I use. But when I'm doing veneers or veneer and crown cases, very link aesthetic. There's other great ones though, Wes. I mean, are Let you me just using you, the I'm 3M Reliance, yeah. right? Yeah, I'm using Relax Veneer Cement, which is a great yeah. product. Great cement. Great, great cement. It's great cement. It's easy to work with. But my product of the week for cementing veneers is not even a cement. Oh. It's actually a triple zero cord from Premier. Ah. I, I love triple it. Triple zero dot zero? Triple zero dot zero. And uh, that's... Triple uh, aught dot aught. <laughs> that's what I call it. Dot <laughs> so why in the world nil, would I nil, want nil. this? Because nil. sometimes, sometimes, you know, you've got that margin that just runs underneath. And listen, I love knit pack. A, mm -hmm. a lot of times because veneer preps are in enamel, you don't have to numb the patient so much. So being able to pack a cord without anesthetic is awesome. Right, and, right. And, and this just slips below the tissue. One of the greatest things that Premier ever invented is one, their cord, but number two is the cord dispenser. It actually has a little razor blade built right into oh, the no, top. It's such a great, such you a great pull system. it out and the assistant loves it. You just close the cap and it crisp little cut. So no more fiddling or futzing around no scissors, as my man. assistants say, you know, with these scissors that don't cut the cord, they're dull and you're like throwing them across the room. Yeah. <laughs> but that's yeah. the, that's the thing is those little things matter. And, yep. uh, you know, yeah. And again, I think that if you, if you get, you know, I want to, I want to encourage everybody that, you know, as we kind of finish up talking about this, you know, to uh, about, you know, ho hopefully you've gotten from this episode, you know, you've gotten some really good practical information about, you know, wh how to bond a zirconia. If you want to try to bond a zirconia, why you might be a little disappointed about your bond is zirconia. And then what are we currently doing that I think is based on the latest evidence out there but the other thing I would encourage you to do, you know, we talk a lot about this veneer bonding stuff and everything. I, go take a course on veneer bonding. You know, go take go take a course from somebody good on how to deliver veneers. We get so many questions about this. We get people yeah. asking about, you know, veneers and how do I deliver veneers? And, you know, it's interesting, Wes, there used to be a ton of courses out there on this. That because in like the 90s when veneers became like kind of mainstream, widely accepted, there were all kinds of people teaching how to do veneers. I, I rarely see like hands-on courses, especially on how to prep and deliver veneers anymore. And it's kind of sad Wouldn't because it be I think a it's a great course that you oh, would go man. into. You would learn how to do the bond, uh, the prepping. Yep. Okay. And then what you would do is they would have a model there. Yeah. That was like this simulated dental model that had veneers already ready, already ready to go, feldspathic porcelain, whatever, it didn't matter, a non-silicate based, okay? Yep. Or a silicate based ceramic, right? Yeah, yeah, silicate based, yeah. Silicate based ceramic, and then you actually went through the protocol on the typodont yep. of bonding just six in place at the same time. And the, and you've got to feel a little bit of the stress of the that. The stress. And, 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 and become comfortable. That would be a great with, course. It would be a great course. It would sell out every time. If, it would be amazing. Because people... People want to do this. They want to learn. So if you hear about a course like that, see, I don't even know of any, Wes. I like, you know, I we might have to look sometimes. and put that in as like uh, the next episode of Cheap But Good CE. 
Maybe because if I I've, I see still I see people teaching. I'd some like to go take courses. it just because I'd like to take it for our listeners to tell uh, them whether it's yeah, good. Yeah, I'd love to take a, a course like from somebody who's really good because it's been I don't know it's been ten years since I've taken a course like that. Maybe more, more than ten years since I've taken a course just like that. Because you're so good. You're so. Oh, good. it's just because I'm so. Well, I got to give it up one more time to Ray Bertolotti, right? Because he's the one oh, who taught me. So That's it. hey, man. Like you're like a brother from another mother with me, man. Because <laughs> so that's funny. my guy. You know, yeah, that's my that's who guy. taught me to deliver in prep veneers. And and yep. I mean, guys like that just aren't around anymore. It it's seems strange, like it's, man. It's yeah. strange. We want to go see him, and would like to get him on the show someday, maybe. Yeah, one of these but days. One of these days. Hey, listen, if you've been joining us, I think we've had listeners and watchers uh, all week or all week, all evening long tonight. And uh, you've yeah, got for the live broadcast. Us. Thanks for hanging with us tonight. Hey, listen, like and share us on Facebook. It's a wonderful uh, place for us to kind of connect to you. I know there was somebody that just sent us a shout out tonight. It kind of encouraged me, like, just to keep trucking along. They said they just yep. really appreciated the show. So I really appreciate that uh, nice comment that someone sent us saying, hey, there's just really. Uh, those things really mean a lot to John and I as we move forward with the dental guys. Hey, we are on Twitter. Uh, A lot of people connect with us there. So if you're over there, it's at the dental guys on Twitter. Of course, we do have a YouTube channel. You can join us and watch, uh, watch us talk shop. A lot of times our emotion and hand gestures (laughs) are fun to watch. Um, so you can check us out on YouTube. We'll be continuing to do some of this live stream things and don't forget some of the special things coming up in September. And uh, for for John, I'm Wes, and this has been The Dental Guys. <laughs>